So we give the floor to Antonio. Yes. Well, good afternoon to everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome all the participants of this webinar. I would also like to extend a special greeting to the speakers and moderators who agreed to contribute to an open and frank debate on a subject of the utmost importance. Thank you very much. I am also very pleased to thank Patrice Maupassant, the Second General, and the members of the Euro Defense Outreach Group, led by Bart Browers. They have worked hard to prepare this video conference. Thank you very much. As you know, this uh, initiative aims to broaden reflections on the important issues raised in the Euro Defense Working Group 27, especially in the recommendations sent to the European institutions. Let me confess that um, I am convinced that uh, in the history of Euro Defense, of which I have been a, a member for a long time, few working groups have aroused as much interest and uh, in-depth debate as the EWG 27. Some topics provoke diverging positions, as is expected in uh, these debates, but uh, they were overtaken thanks to the effort of all to moderate ambitions, and uh, especially thanks to the strong leadership of the group president, Dr. Eric van Dorn, who I greet and congratulate here today for such excellent contribution to our Euro defense. Thank you very much, Eric. It is important, however, to say that everyone who did participate in these debates wanted to contribute with our ideas and proposals for a more effective security and defense of the European Union, based on improved capabilities and a better organization. Therefore, I think the theme choose, chosen for this webinar is very, very appropriate. It is high time for European Union and member states to break the impasse. That is, to be more ambitious, to decide which route and what means are needed to better protect the citizens within and beyond their borders, considering the geopolitical challenges of an increasing fragmenting world and the rise of new risks and threats in present times. We need an ambition, ambitious vision for the future of the European defense policy. Over the Euro Europe as a credible producer of regional security and of course, Europe as a global player for peace. Given the importance of this issue, Euro Defense Portugal decided to include a panel to discuss these matters in the program of the next international meeting Euro Defense in Lisbon next June 7th. 17th. The conference programs, program includes particularly important discussion topics, such as the new and more promising landscapes for strengthening the transatlantic link, link and uh, to reinforce the partnership with NATO with uh, the new president, Joe Biden. We will not even hesitate to discuss more sensitive issues, such as how far you member states should go to balance the effectiveness of joint action with the relevance of the national 
sovereignty. We will take into consideration as a starting point, the conclusions and the recommendations of the EWG 27 with a view to gathering input for the new EWG 27B that will start soon. I am sure that uh, today's debate will be a first step towards the Lisbon Conference and uh, an invaluable contribution to the development of new proposals to be addressed by Eurodefense to national decision makers and the European Union institutions in fulfillment of the objectives of our Eurodefense network. I wish you a pleasant debate. Thank you very much. So I, I remind that uh, Dr. Antonio Lopez is the president of uh, Eurodefense Portugal and he is the active president of the network. So now we could go to the first round table and I give the floor to the moderator, Anna Kojanen, who is president of Eurodefense Finland. Anna, you can, you can start. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, good evening to everyone from Helsinki. I'm very happy to be part of this webinar uh, of the Euro Defence Network, uh, also on behalf of the, uh, the new Finnish chapter. I will be the uh, moderator of the first uh, round of discussions. We will have two speakers. And um, after the two speakers, time for comments and questions. And I like to recall that for questions, you can use the YouTube uh, chat function and we will get your uh, questions here. Um, let me now introduce our first two speakers. First, we will listen to Erik van Dorn, who is the vice president of Eurodefense Euro Netherlands long-term consultants and advisor in various international affairs. Uh, he's also co-founder and chair of the Netherlands Human Rights Roundtable. Uh, Erik van Dorn, as we already heard, is a very central person for today's discussion, as he chaired the working group that prepared the Eurodefense report and recommendations that can be found on the uh, Eurodefense uh, webpage as well. Um, our second speaker in this first round of discussions is quite fittingly an expert from Portugal, the country that, as you know, holds the uh, EU Council uh, presidency for the moment. Dr. Liliana Reis is assistant professor at the University of Beira Interior, uh, director of the degree of political science and international relations, at the Lusophone University of Humanities and Technologies in Lisbon. And she's also researcher at the Portuguese uh, Institute of International Affairs. So these will be our two uh, first speakers and um, both of them will speak for uh, 10 to 12 minutes. And afterwards we have time for discussion. So I would first hand over the floor to Erik van Dorn, please. Could you just unmute? Your sound is not uh, hearing. Is it, do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you, Antonio, for your kind words. <clears throat> Part of the things I'm going to say are not necessarily representative for Working Group 27, uh, but it's all part of the question, breaking the impasse. That's the question. Um, what is the impasse? An impasse is a standstill. And an impasse is a standstill if you want to go forward. But where do you want to go to? What direction? Uh, in order to answer that question, let's, you, let's first use our imagination. Imagine a perfect storm. In the year 2031, which is 10 years from now, um, there are threats in all domains. 
not as, man as massive conventional military operations, but as threats of a very diverse nature and large scale. Large scale. I give you examples. Military infiltrations near Kirkenes in Norway, terrorism attacks in a number of EU capitals, um, followed by civil unrest and riots. A, pand a new pandemic originated in Africa and is conquering Europe. A sudden immigration flow in the Mediterranean area. Obstructions for freedom of navigation in the Bosporus, the Northern Passage, and in Asia. Cyber attacks have paralyzed the EU banking and payment system. And there is a sudden stop of in energy and industrial raw materials imports. All over the EU, unidentified drones are reported and involved in criminal activities such as drug smuggling. Just to mention a few things that separately are not so surprising. But it could happen together and that's the perfect storm. And it's not even a war. How will the EU and its member states be able to meet these challenges? What do we need? Did strategic compass in the year 2022 foresee these events? We certainly are aware of the hybrid nature of all these challenges. Some of them do need a military response. Some need a network of organizations in civil society that can increase and support resolve and resilience, give people the feeling that the EU and their own government is capable of protecting them, like the old fashioned Red Cross did. Follow the, follow the subsidiarity principle. Do local and national what you can, do at the EU level if you can't. Learn, learn from the COVID pandemic. Example, the central procurement of vaccines by the, uh, by the EU. Um, I won't say it was a success, but it showed how necessary it was to do it. Apply principles of, of strategic autonomy to the perfect storm. What are the essentials that we need within the EU to be able to withstand all these challenges? Like procurement of medicine, of chips, of military equipment, of ammunition, certain essential raw materials. And where do we stand now? Actually, looking at the treaty, we have agreed to be a defense union. There is an unconditional commitment to support EU member states with all available means if requested. This is much stronger than Article 5 of the NATO Organizations uh, Treaty, but it does not have any consequences. There is no EU force, nor the capability to immediately act together. Let us look at EU security and defense. The EU is a global player with three global competitors and divided and old-fashioned old -fashioned security and defense capabilities. There are 27 armies, an enormous combined budget of over 200 billion. Most member states are partners in NATO, but under US leadership with its own foreign policy. And that is a policy that is not always in the interest of the EU. Look, for example, at the policy vis-a-vis -vis the Russian Federation. For the EU, it's a neighborhood policy. And for the US, it's a rival on a distance. I'm not even talking about the content of the policy, but from the point of view of the maker of the policy, it's quite a difference. True, a number of EU initiatives for bi- and multilateral defense cooperation will certainly support the long-term objective of strategic autonomy. PESCO is a good example. Unfortunately, the past 70 years have shown that a long list of bi- and multilateral defense cooperation projects and initiatives have not resulted in a credible EU defense organization or credible EU defense capabilities. Why don't we organize this at the EU level? A level? For most member states, giving up sovereignty is a non-issue. While at the same time, they have already transferred a considerable part of their sovereignty to the EU. Then they say, but defense is different. Yes, but almost no EU member state is able to seriously defend itself. At present, the EU as a whole is not able to give a serious response in case of a crisis during the first six months. 
then why not pool and share capabilities and organize them at the EU level under central command if required. This is one of the essential elements of our Euro defense recommendations. As we all know, for common foreign and security policy decisions, unanimous decision making is required and paralyzing any attempt to agree on a common EU foreign security and defense policy. In most member states, populism and nationalism will prevent transfer to the EU of their illusionary sovereignty by their governments. This results in hesitant and lukewarm political support for pro-EU policies by the leading political parties and by the government leaders in the EU Council. How to proceed from the present to the future? Probably the strategic compass will give us a picture of the threats that we can expect in the future, as I've tried to do with the perfect storm analogy. We probably will also agree on a number of measures as a response to these threats. These responses will be different in nature. There are three categories, strategic and political. So these are the responses to the, um, the strategic uh, compass. Um, strategic and political um, formulate answers to various kinds of threats, analyze the effectiveness of EU policies. What's the effectiveness of boycotts and sanctions? Does it diminish threats for citizens? Simply criticizing, boycotting and sanctioning competitors and adversaries is probably not the best policy to protect EU citizens. But if you have no other instruments at your disposal, what can you do? However, have a proper defense capabilities and a deterrent may reduce threats instead of increasing them. Organizational. EU military command structures and an integrated EU defense organization. And how do we combine and integrate national capabilities and EU capabilities? And what is the task of individual members? And the third category is technical capabilities. So the answer to the threats analysis and the compass is strategic and political, organizational, and the technical capabilities. There are a number of them. I'm not a technician, but say space reconnaissance, uh, marine reconnaissance, laser weapon development, and all these highly technical things. Um, and a limited but highly professional and effective rep uh, rapid response EU defense um, units, the so called blue badges, um, as Euro Defense has proposed and elaborated in its recommendations. One thing is clear, do not continue doing the same conventional Cold War things better. Stop spending money on keeping old equipment up to date, invest in the future and not in improving 20th century capabilities. Broaden the concept of security and defense because conventional military capabilities will be only be part of a wide variety of capabilities that must protect the population of the EU and strengthen its resilience against all these diverse external and even internal threats. Define technologies to be developed. What is too big and too expensive for a member states should be done and organized by the EU and the member states together. The EU should also arrange to finance the development of EU defense capabilities in concert with member states. Now back to the question, how to break the impasse. Most of the things that I've said are wholly or partly acceptable to a majority of EU member states and citizens. There's an increasing awareness that the EU must become a credible union that's able to protect its citizens against a variety of threats. As President Macron said, an Europe qui protège. If citizens experience this protection by the European Union, they will probably become more positive about it. The impasse is the decision making process. The impasse is the decision making process. Although qualified majority voting is applied in the EU, it's not applied to some essential domains, such as health services, foreign policy, and security and defense. Breaking the impasse would require at least one unanimous decision, 
namely the single decision to vote in the future by QMV on a number of essential issues for EU foreign and defense policy and on the decision to enable the EU to proceed with the establishment of an EU defense organization under EU command with the normal democratic controls by the parliament and member states. Organizing the checks and balances on the deployment of EU capabilities will be comparable to the procedures in a number of member states. However, breaking the impasse requires understanding that democracy and unanimity are not identical and not even linked to each other. All member state governments are based on some form of coalition. Democratic rules require these governments to take the interests of the not represented political parties into account. Those are the rules. Unanimous approval for essential political decisions is almost contradictory to democracy. This notion should be at the basis of the last unanimous decision by the Council. Breaking the impasse means stopping the unanimity requirement. What could replace it? A variety of Q QMV mechanisms. Criteria are at present the number of states, member states, number of inhabitants. One could add to that military contribution to EU defense capabilities, gross domestic product, etc., etc. There are lots of variables there. Another way out of the impasse is a limited defense union comparable to the, what happened to the Eurozone. A combination of the willing with a number of member states abstaining but tolerating. And if sustaining and tolerating is still not acceptable, a coalition of the willing could start organizing its defense together. These are just a few thoughts and remarks on the question how to break the impasse. Many thanks for an excellent start for our discussions. We will certainly uh, discuss the, uh, the issues of uh, qualified majority voting uh, and others later on. Uh, I'd propose we listen to Dr. Liliana Reich now. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Era Defense for inviting me to participate in this webinar. It is an honor for me to be here with you today, even online. I also want to share with you that my reflection does not rep represent the official position of Portugal, but only my research. Uh, I think this point, it's, uh, it's necessary. Uh, well, uh, the main issues I will address in, in my, my um, presentation will be European security, environment and uh, pandemic impact on European security and defense, European and NATO reaction, PESCO projects and European defense industrial de development program uh, between intergovernmental uh, and supranational approaches, strategic compass and uh, and the Portuguese presidency of the council challenge and opportunities. Uh, first of all, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed the vulnerability of states to the new threats and at the same time their complex nature. But it also came to uncover the interdependence of states and the clear need to greater cooperation between all actors in the international system. Notwithstanding this apparent incapacity of states in isolation to respond to new threats, the exceptional moment we are experiencing has revealed contradictory dynamics. If when, uh, one end the member states of the European Union did not respond uniformly and uh, with solidarity to the public health emergency that uh, affected them, there was a high standard of differentiation in the measures adopted. Uh, on the other hand, with the Atlantic Alliance, uh, it was observed once more than the member states when exposed to more demanding situations have deep cleavage. Well, 
uh, the COVID-19 worsens, uh, COVID <laughs> COVID worsens dramatically and remains for a long time the recent EU initiatives in the field of defense such as uh, the permanent uh, structured uh, cooperation and the European Defence Fund could be at risk. Uh, PESCO projects were conditioned by free movement of persons across the European Union for technological PESCO pro projects. Engineers and scientists sometimes have to move from one country to another and for training PESCO projects, military personnel have to meet to work together. And in the last uh, uh, months, uh, this was um, uh, paralyzed. Well, uh, um, COVID-19 uh, has also impact on European uh, budget. Um, European Defense Fund uh, and its budget still needs to be agreed on uh, by European Union head of states and governments. But with the current situation, prior, priority in the European Union budget could go towards the healthcare sector instead of defense sector. The budget of the European Defense Fund uh, is then at risk also of a reduction. Moreover, the COVID-19 may be could slow down a deal between European leaders on the European Union budget. Um, also, common security and uh, uh, defense response uh, uh, to COVID-19 were compromised uh, and uh, redesigned to address to, to COVID-19. In the face of the coronavirus pandemic, the CSDP missions and operations continue to deliver on their security mandate, but these mandates were uh, tailor-made to, to address uh, um, all, all the, the situation. While ongoing missions and operations do not have a humanitarian aid mandate, with their exist existing mandates, means and capabilities, civilian missions are providing specific advice and sharing information with international and national partners, helping to address the pandemic. Several missions are also donating medical and protective equi equipment, and the actions of CSDP missions are in full coherence with the wider actions undertaken by the Team Europe global uh, response to coronavirus addressing and the humanitarian health, uh, social and economic consequences to the crisis. Uh, well, it's not only the European Union that, uh, and the common security and defense policy that need to address to, to this new threat, but also NATO. Uh, and with NATO and uh, uh, this new environment, uh, um, the organization, uh, for the first time in its, uh, in its history, had faced an attack to uh, all its member states at once. Uh, and given the, the scenario of political tensions with the alliance in recent years, uh, there was a little reason to be optimistic about uh, uh, NATO response, especially at a time when transatlantic allies were failing to coordinate travel restrictions and, complete, and competed for the suppression of equipment. Despite this scenario, this pessimistic scenario, uh, NATO, uh, NATO was, able, uh, was able to protect its experience in crisis and disaster management to provide two type, uh, two and uh, maybe two, three types of responses. First of all, uh, uh, in the first dimension was on missions, the second on exercises, and the third on disinformation. Uh, in terms of operational framework, NATO was addressed the pandemic situation following the protocol defined by hybrid threats. Um, uh, in, in spite of, of this situation, NATO uh, was also reduced uh, its military activities, including operational training and exercises, by 33%. Um, 
uh, not to focus uh, on the, since the first time on ensuring continuity of operations while protecting its military to prevent the health crisis from effective, uh, affecting readiness. Uh, and most of NATO missions have been preserved, but some are temporarily suspended. Military exercises have been redesigned, uh, uh, including the US-led NATO exercise Defender U Europe 20 to prevent the virus from spreading. In addition, NATO uh, branch of public diplomacy has multiplied efforts to combat uh, disinformation in China and uh, in Russia. Well, uh, NATO has also created a task force COVID-19 designed to coordinate the delivery of medical aid uh, within and outside the uh, um, alliance territory. Such actions, although carried out by NATO member states and re relatively limited, were an important testament to the reactive capacity of the alliance and solidarity among member states, uh, in spite of this uh, pessimistic uh, um, view. However, it is reasonable to imagine that more could have been done in the organization did not have to overcome political tensions in the Atlantic and the member states had cooperated from the uh, from the, the first beginning, from, from the start, under the leadership of the strongest uh, NATO uh, member. Well, European defense after pandemic uh, uh, revealed uh, the state's vulnerability to new threats, as uh, we already uh, discuss, discussed here, and at the same time, their complex nature. Uh, but it also came to uncover the interdependence of states and the clear need for greater cooperation between them, uh, between all the states, states and uh, international organizations, international organizations with international organizations. Pandemic highlighted uh, the apparent hand of US hegemony and the intensification of relations between the two sides of Atlantic with the Biden election also. Slowing economic growth, uh, it's also uh, uh, a, new, a new issue uh, that uh, pandemic revealed, and substantial reduction in defense budgets. We are likely to see an entirely different dimension to the debate over the Atlantic burden sharing in the next uh, uh, months and uh, probably years. Uh, in, in respect of PEXCO projects and European Defense Industrial Development Program, uh, for me, revealed the, the two um, uh, different uh, dynamics in European Union. Uh, for one side, PESCO uncovers the real dynamic behind the integration process with the framework of European defense, patenting the interests of the member states in this matter but at the same time showing the need for the member states to go beyond even the intergovernmental negotiations in the classic uh, um, framework of the Council that require unan unanimity uh, and forming a, a classic alliance uh, uh, as uh, to see that shown uh, in the Peloponnesian War. Uh, but for Another side, European Defence Industrial Development Programme presents itself as a fundamental pillar of the European Defence Fund, an initiative incorporated, incorporated into PESCO, uh, aimed at promoting greater collaboration between European Union member states in spending of, uh, on defence. And this initiative aims to alleviate the traditional resistance of member states to provide uh, the, the need resources for the projection of European Union power and to encourage cross-border cooperation between European companies uh, and multinationals and member states in order to support greater competitiveness and uh, uh, capacity innovation in the European defence sector as a whole. Uh, European Defence Industrial Development Programme reinforced the European Commission's powers over national indus industries of national defence interest 
in a clear uh, supranational logic. Well, uh, this is uh, two uh, antagonic uh, uh, approaches that uh, uh, European defense uh, reveal to us and, and show uh, to us. Um, in respect of strategic compass, I, I want to underline that convergence of, over a narrowed set of uh, essential prior priorities is absolutely uh, fundamental and crucial, and the greater precision of common security and defense uh, uh, policy uh, uh, functional and regional priorities. The correct follow-up uh, of the workshops during the strategic dialogue in uh, this year for a better adjustment of instruments and institutions and uh, um, also uh, consolidate the principle of subsidiarity and interaction at, at a different levels and actors between the European Union institutions and the European Union uh, and its member states, the public and private sectors, civil and military actors, and the European Union and NATO uh, as well. Um, uh, in capacity building, the common security and defense policy must work closely with European Union member states and NATO defense planning process, uh, and also building a streamlined and simplified the European Union capacity prioritization process. Uh, but above all, uh, they need operationalized complementarity between European Union and NATO and uh, United Nations str structures address and define the labor division between partners, between European Union members, within the European Union as an organization, as well as a between civilian and military tools for resilience and uh, uh, crisis management. Uh, in respect of Portuguese, Portuguese presidency of the Council, um, well, long-term solutions to any conflict are thus uh, that bring together all, all local, national, regional, and global players uh, with a common interest in peace. Portugal is admittedly an Atlantic and an European and Lusophone country. Uh, one of my universities are uh, Lusophone. Uh, therefore, it should uh, assume itself as a privileged interlocutor between the two uh, international organizations, NATO and the European Union. Portugal, um, these, these uh, last months, revealed also more operational orientation of the European Union global strategy through the common European strategic co uh, compass and the consolidation of the German expectations. But uh, uh, Portugal focused in three areas uh, uh, in this moment. Uh, uh, this is my, my, my view. Cybersecurity and uh, capacity building between NATO and PESCO projects in which uh, cyber threats and incident response information sharing platform and European Union Cyber Academia, Academia and Innovation Hub uh, that Portugal participate. The threat of multi-vector cyber attacks uh, was increased exponentially with the digitalization of public and private sectors in member states after uh, COVID-19 pandemic. The second area is the, the development of a joint maritime strategy that responds not only to the Mediterranean, but also to the Black Sea and the Arctic uh, and associated NATO and the European Union, namely among the following PESCO projects, Maritime Enamed Anti-Submarine System, MUSES, uh, MUSES, Airborne and Maritime Surveillance and Protection, and Maritime Semi-Autonomous Systems for Mine Countermeasures. NATO is an alliance between United States uh, and European Union, united for an ocean, and Portugal is the linkage of this ocean. Foster and uh, foster the interoperability of the joint exercises of the Alliance and the European Union through the PESCO projects of military mobility and standardization through the European Union Training Mission Competence Center. Liliana, um, can you conclude? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, to final remarks. Want to debate? Uh, yeah. <coughs> 
two final remarks I want uh, only to, to conclude that the pandemic has evidenced an end of the um, uh, probably an, an uh, liberal uh, um, uh, hegemony order and an intensification of relations between the two sides of the Atlantic, paradoxically. Slowing economic growth and a substantial reduction in defense budgets, we are likely to see an entirely different dimension for the debate over the transatlantic. Um, but we are on the front fragmentation of multilateralism, or will solidarity survive to, re to the recession? Thank you. Thank you very much, Liliana, for bringing in the whole context of the uh, pandemic uh, that changes so many things uh, that brings uh, up both the uh, both vulnerabilities, but also interdependencies and uh, totally new questions to us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we now have some 20 minutes for uh, questions and answers. We have some in the chat already, but I would really like to start with going back slightly to something that both of you mentioned, and particularly Eric, and that was the other question of uh, qualified majority voting. Now, um, would you see any um, shortcomings in that? Um, than a solution to the problem of, of decision making. I am, I am thinking of the potential um, negative effects of using qualified voting. Would you think that uh, the positive ones still outweigh the negative? Uh, I'm thinking in particular of how the countries that uh, are in a minority position after a decision has been taken, how they will feel in the future about the cooperation. And also, could it possibly be uh, leading to a situation where the internal um, differences between the member states become more visible, even more visible than they are today? And also perhaps poss uh, increasing the possibility for outsiders to exploit uh, those differences. This would be my question to, to start with, please. Anna, asking them so in such a detailed manner is almost answering them. Um, um, of, of course, you're right. Um, both systems have advantages and disadvantages. Um, at the present system, no, one, one, and I go the other way around. Um, with QMV, um, you, you lose the unanimity also towards the outside world. It's, uh, it, it would be unique if Europe would be the only place in the world where 27 countries share one common goal and, and join forces and take responsible decisions. Um, but it's a weakness also. The weakness is that any outsider could strongly influence a small European country and ruin the system. And um, what do we do then? Do we say uh, we prefer the idealism of, of unanimity, but it doesn't work, or we become more practical. With the Euro, we have been extremely successful to overcome that problem. And we have said, let's first agree that a monetary union um, is preferable to the system we have now in Europe. Ultimately, everybody could agree with that. And at the same time, a number of countries said, fine, but we don't participate. And um, that abstention was not hostile, uh, mainly based on, on assumed self-interest. Um, and it's still there today, but we cannot say that Europe is divided and weak because not everybody is in the Euro. Um, going back to foreign policy, um, countries, even threat analysis, 
for the Baltic states is completely different than threat analysis for Portugal or for the Netherlands or for Greece. Um, the nature of the threats is different and the intensity of the threats as well. Um, so what we'll have to do with the compass is to, to have a common vision on how Europe should react and how we should all cooperate uh, uh, in supporting these decisions, how to formulate a foreign policy for the EU as a whole. Uh, we, in my opinion, we will ne simply never be able to accomplish that um, with uh, unanimity. So it is for me, it's not a question uh, of uh, shall we do unanimity with a few handicaps and a few problems delaying the process, etc. It's it simply will never give the result that we need to meet the challenges of the perfect storm. And um, and I on the opposite, there's another aspect that is. Um, in a, a number of European countries, there is increasing nationalism, sometimes even in the form of anarchism, and, and but anti-EU sentiment. And um, it may well be that in, in, in a few member countries, that will be a majority sentiment. Um, then you have either QMV or you have nothing. So um, let's prepare for the worst and say we are not all we are not all have not all the same kind of democracy and the same kind of view on the world. All twenty seven countries. So let's protect us as a whole against disruptions and and let's uh, uh, remodel the decision making process. I'm just trying to give aspects. And I cannot say, as you invited me to say, well, is this better or that? Are there negatives on this and negatives on that? It's ex extremely complex, but finally, I must conclude, QRV is the only solution. That's my opinion. I'm not talking on behalf of a working group, or, uh, uh, but after talking about this for two years, this is my conclusion. Thank you very much indeed. Your uh, most helpful question uh, answer also brought up the uh, the other big issue that I wanted to ask uh, Liliana about the uh, threat perception and whether that is one of the uh, essential priorities in the strategic compass and whether you think progress will be made or whether the, the threat perception will remain uh, something that divides the countries. This would be my question to Liliana, what do you like to? Okay, thank you, Anne. Uh, of course, this, this period has compromised the benign vision of European Union and uh, also the, the, the um, strategic compass uh, development. Um, uh, the member states and their institutions uh, look today to the European institutions with uh, um, suspicions. Su suspicions. Uh, solidarity is also compromised whenever we have greater deficiencies but uh, namely on uh, uh, capacities building and the strategic compass uh, wants to correct them, the, to close the gap that uh, Christopher Hill talked uh, uh, in 1993. Um, but European states are all poor after this pandemic. Uh, cooperation is the only uh, possibility for states to respond to the threats they have, even if Portugal and uh, Finland or Holland uh, do not feel the same threat. Solidarity for me and uh, burden sharing is the only way to create value and preserve our values, not only in European Union, uh, uh, but also in NATO. Uh, and w when I uh, uh, talk about our values, uh, I talk about our freedom, our democracy, 
uh, our human rights uh, framework, uh, security and defense are not only to protect us, but also to protect our values. The strategic compass wants uh, 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 the main vision of German presidency and, and the, uh, now the Portuguese presidency is not uh, only to close the, the gap uh, between capabilities and expectations about European defense, but is also uh, uh, to consolidate uh, uh, the European uh, core of values and uh, um, gain tools uh, to defend uh, to defend us and to uh, export our values to all the world and to project us as a European global actor, seriously. We need this right now. It's time to stop to pretend uh, and uh, to play uh, to European defense. Uh, right now, uh, if we uh, not close this gap, we, we probably uh, will fragmentate not only uh, more the, than... Um, that uh, exposed the, that uh, pandemic exposed, but also uh, we can uh, uh, observe and exist to uh, emergence of populisms and extreme right in Europe. Thank you. Um, I have here two questions from the chat to Eric. Uh, Mark Vogelar is asking. Are you in favor of the EU and not individual member states possessing nuclear weapons as part of its capabilities? This issue wasn't mentioned in the working group paper, I believe. Why not? So the first question about uh, nuclear weapons and then a question from Willy Herkeler. Are we as Eurodefense Association going to tackle all aspects of the perfect storm or limit ourselves to defense using the military in appropriate crises? So these would be to you. The second, the second question is uh, um, relatively easy to answer. It's, um, of course, Euro Defense and, and its working group should, uh, should uh, be busy with uh, defense related issues. And also we, we can say everybody, everything is hybrid and it's interconnected, uh, but let's concentrate on, on um, defense issues. And um, uh, that is difficult enough because simply talking about defense from a point of view of technology is so completely different from 50 years ago that, al that already uh, requires a uh, widened scope and, and a completely new approach to defense, in my opinion. Um, I hope that's an answer. Um, the first answer is, um, fortunately, it's not in my room, but that's the very big elephant in all our rooms, the nuclear issue. Um, France is a nuclear power and is part of the EU. And for the time being, nobody's discussing that situation. And uh, at the same time, we have uh, the so-called US umbrella, uh, under which we shelter. And um, in the present situation, it's my opinion that everybody thinks, let's not rock the boat. Uh, life is difficult enough. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's a situation, in my opinion, that nobody wants to really move. Uh, so if the question is, uh, do you see nuclear capabilities at the EU level in the future in our possible vision as Euro defense. Um, if the conclusion is that the EU should have the capability to defend, its, uh, defend itself in the highest spectrum, and uh, then you should. Uh, I do not see an EU that will come to the conclusion that it will leave that option out. Yes. 
Um, that is the situation today. If we talk about values, I didn't touch that issue because you can also ask if we want to defend ourselves, what do we defend? And um, I touched a li little bit on that. We can te teach the whole world how to behave, but let's first agree on what good behavior is and what we consider very valuable in Europe. And let's apply that. Uh, and once you, have, once you have that and you say we have to defend that, then you could say pacifism is part of that uh, collective uh, um, ideal. Um, I don't think we'll come to that point. Um, uh, let's be realistic. Uh, um, uh, if the, uh, the global powers uh, have the capability and uh, can threaten us uh, with uh, ICBMs and nuclear weapons and all that, uh, we have at least to defend ourselves. And that's, it's, that's part, part of it. We are part of that. And let's do the minimum to be credible. That is my opinion. It's let's not take the lead and say we want to be the vanguard of uh, nuclear development and of interballistic uh, technology and all these things and space war. But let's just do enough to protect ourselves and be credible. And that also comes from nuclear weapons. I think that's an answer. Thank you very much indeed. Now I propose uh, that we take one more question in this first round uh, because we have in the chat a, uh, another question for Liliana that is basically uh, Ron Keller asking uh, Liliana's point of view on qualified majority voting that uh, does work in um, that what he wrote is that we also govern our current nations by qualified majority voting that works fine and is democratic. So why would an inclusive uh, qualified majority voting at European level all over, uh, over sudden not, not work? Uh, basically asking uh, Liliana on the use of qualified majority voting, please. Okay, thank you. Um, the political majority vote uh, is not applied to uh, defense matters on European Union, neither common security and defense policy. And uh, I think the, this will probably don't, uh, don't uh, be changed in the future. Uh, we, the unanimity uh, will remain uh, on uh, security and defense policy because we talk about height politics. Uh, we talk about the, the um, uh, sovereignty pillar of member states. The member states uh, um, prefer to, to majority votes, to a market, to concurrency, to, um, to political uh, subjects, not, uh, not height politics. Uh, only uh, low politics. Um, when I talk about PESCO project and unanimity uh, and surface of unanimity, I talk about uh, the consolidation of a classical intergovernmental pillar of, un uh, of European Union with a, cl uh, a clear um, view of uh, a uh, of an intergovernmental organization like NATO, uh, uh, not uh, uh, the, uh, the re reinforce or, or supranational or co decision uh, and the co uh, ma majority qualified uh, uh, of the common security and defense subjects. We only observe the supranational. Uh, power and commission of uh, European defense only on European defense agency and uh, uh, other things related to research and development, related to universities for one side and private sector for uh, other side to reinforce the European defense, not on voting not on the decision-making process. The decision-making process will probably 
uh, remain uh, in the next uh, decades on, in, on the Council with unanimity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liliana. Uh, now um, I would propose that we move on to the second part. Um, our, um, there we have our next, uh, uh, next moderator, Bart Broers from the uh, Dutch uh, chapter of, uh, of Eurodefense and a very central person in our reach of the network. The floor is now yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, Hannah. Um, also, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, we have, and for the second panel, we have a, a group with lots of uh, experience and, uh, that, and long, uh, long careers and deeply with deep involvement in uh, European defense uh, and foreign security. Um, first, we have um, we have Yanis, Frederico Yanis. Uh, who is a Spanish general, um, and he has been uh, involved in uh, several research institutes in which, amongst others, he has uh, investigated the uh, Partnership for Peace. After that, we have uh, General Jean-Paul Perouche. Um, he, has, he is the former uh, president of Eurodefense uh, France, and he has, was the chief of the military mission to Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe. Last but not least, we have uh, Hans Schulte, who was the um, uh, who is the uh, former editor of the uh, German language Griffin Defense Security Industry Publications, um, and they will talk a little bit more about the uh, more practical aspects of this discussion. I think. So let us start with Federico Janis. Please. Your sound is not working, Federico. We did not hear you. You must uh, put your microphone. Um. Otherwise, we could also just start with uh, uh, Jean-Paul Perouche, if yes. you're all right with that. Let's go with the flow. So you... Thank yes, you. Sir. You listen to me? Yes. <laughs> okay. So I start. Let me, let me in a few seconds uh, uh, recall uh, very uh, swiftly on uh, some remarks about the uh, current uh, uh, European defense position, as already a little pointed out by a uh, uh, previous uh, speaker, uh, in the world security context of the 21st century, all European nations are unable to deal uh, with defense challenges individually. First remark. Second, most of them rely on NATO and the United States for their defense. But we know, uh, we have known now for more than 10 years that uh, security strategic interests of the US are moving uh, to- uh, yes, Excuse me, Jan Paul, I was yes. supposed to enter now according to the schedule that has been presented by the organizers. <laughs> we are already- but yes. uh, I am the one to speak now, according to the schedule. Yes. Okay. I got the floor because you were not uh, on the on the picture. Uh, no, no. Uh, it, it's happened something with the micro, but the micro can be uh, open by Bart, and I open it myself, and it's, I am ready to speak. Okay. You. And I was no already problem speaking. For I was already speaking. No. Uh, so, I was saying that it's for me a pleasure to have the opportunity to share some ideas with you uh, at the end of the day, yes, when we are entering the evening of this beautiful day. And it was mentioned by Barth, a long career, of course, and I recall when I was a lieutenant colonel and a colonel in the joint staff of the Spanish, of the Spanish Armed Forces, how important was defense planning? Uh, defense planning is essential to create our armed forces. 
and to be able to uh, accost to put the armed forces what do we want according to the threats that we are uh, <coughs> facing we are facing also for that till now there was not an instrument for that in between in the European Union now we do have car that I think is something very essential car is mentioned twice in your paper uh, Eric in European Working Group 27, and it has to be incremented, it has to be augmented somehow because CART uh, now is functioning. And about that, I am going to speak. The first coordinated annual review on defense. Europe's security environment is increasingly dynamic, which requires highly resilient and responsive armed forces. However, However, with the defense planning and development of military assets taking place so far at national level, anticipating and identifying opportunities for European cooperation is often imperative. Initiated by the Council of the European Union in 2016, the Coordinated Annual Review on Defense, or CAR, provides for the first time a fully fledged defense review at European Union level. It provides member states with a comprehensive overview of the European defense landscape, including capability, research, and industrial aspects. At this, as a pamphinder for cooperation, CARD offers member states a tool to increase consistency between their national defense plans from an European perspective and to engage more systematically in a more structured manner in defense cooperation. And of course, answering the question that was raised by Hannah before, of course, as we are advancing in our task to get an European defense, we will find more and more obstacles because we are going to enter in sensitive areas for national, for different member states. And of course, the defense planning is one of those areas that is very sensitive. Uh, NATO defense planning is existing now for many years and has a very advanced procedure uh, to implement it. But in any way, it was difficult to progress and it was difficult to find common, common ideas among different countries, but it was something. Acting as a pathfinder, as I mentioned, what is the purpose of CAR? It's triggering European collaboration. CAR aims to enhance the coherence of the European defense landscape and may result in new cooperation projects launched by member states in various formats under PESCO, within EGA or in other bilateral or multinational frameworks. Some of those may be confounded by the European Defense Fund, PDF, as you know. All collaborative opportunities are linked to the 2018 EU Capability Development Priorities resulting from the Capability Development Plan. Member states which projects may be taken forward and within which format should they decide to develop cooperation in these areas. CAR has identified 55 collaborative opportunities in capability development. I mean, they have studied the defense planning of the different countries, and they have found there are 55 collaborative opportunities in capability development in all operational domains, and 56 related opportunities for research and technology cooperation. Just going fast, to finish the sooner, they, are, they have to identify in the first uh, round six focus areas for collaborations. CAR recommends concentrating capability development efforts on next generation capabilities and preparing the future together with six focus areas. Main battle tank, to upgrade, modernize, and develop the backbone of land-based operations. Soldier systems, 
improve individual protection and operational awareness. Then European patrol class surface ships, then countering aerial threats, then defense in space, access to space services and projection of the space-based assets, and then to enhance European, or perhaps to, to have an enhanced military mobility. By the way, today, the Council has invited the participation of three countries that are not members of the European Union, Canada, Norway, and USA, to participate in the project for military mobility. That's something very, very significant. Then, according to that, we can say at least two words about how CAR works. CAR is a cyclic review of the European defense landscape based on permanent dialogue with the participant member states and between EU institutions. At the start of the CAR process, EVA is calling in coordination with the European Union military staff, and that was a suggestion that we made very, very strongly, because at the, at the beginning it was going to be only something or dinner. But with some of the members that are here, we insisted that it was necessary that the European Union military staff has something to say also in defense planning, in the in CAR, so that the NSA review of defense including European military staff. College information already made available by member states, it has to come from the member states. And if the member states don't, don't contribute, don't collaborate, don't coordinate, it's impossible. Already made available by member states to review their contribution to European defense landscapes. Like bilateral dialogues are then held with each member state to validate, complement, and consolidate the information, making use of NATO defense planning and the Partnership for Peace planning and review process. So we can learn from what NATO is doing in this aspect. It's really very, very important. If we, if the, at, the, at this moment, it's only that's something that is beginning. But if we are able to progress and to get a common defense planning, we will advance a lot. And of course, we are entering very sensitive areas. As kind of something was mentioned before about nuclear. Well, if we are speaking about the European Union defense, perhaps, perhaps if our countries, our member states decide so, we will have to consider the issue in relation with nuclear. Of course, those things are very sensitive for the countries that have nuclear armament uh, in their arsenals. But anyway, that's something that we have to know, that if we want, and really we want to have European Union defense, we have to address all the issues. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Federico Yanis. Uh, now officially over to uh, Jean-Paul Perruche. Thank you very much. Uh, no, I would just say to, to Federico that I was invited to take the floor. I did not do it myself from my own initiative. Uh, something, something else was mistaken because I do have the schedule that was sent to us. Yes, no problem. Uh, no, just to, to sum up what I was saying as an introduction, uh, we must have uh, in mind a realistic picture of the current European defence uh, position now. It's very important to think about all of what we uh, need to do. Uh, individually, all the European nations are no longer able to deal with uh, uh, defence challenges individually. Second, uh, even if the new president of the United States is more attentive than his predecessor to cooperation with uh, operational allies in NATO, uh, NATO will likely not cover in the future all the defense needs of the European, as already uh, seen in Africa, Middle East, etc. Third, in the EU, we have a very limited uh, CSDP, lacking of ambition and capabilities, which is not actually effective to face most of the security challenge. Nevertheless, the EU is the only place where the European can enhance their strategic capabilities and autonomy. 
And therefore, a common approach of EU member states to defense is vital to reinforce them and their contribution to the tran transatlantic alliance. So let me now, uh, in, in a few minutes, identify from my perspective, what is the main failings of CSDP, Command Security and Defense Policy. First, we have a lack of definition of common interest and ambition at the EU level, as already pointed out by, um, uh, by the uh, Igor. Uh, consequently, common defense objectives have to be defined on a case-by-case -case basis according to contingencies from the intersection of 27 national interests, what represent, of course, a very small area. Operational cooperation in the EU looks like uh, this one in traditional coalition at the end of the day. Second, a full intergovernmental approach in defense entail a problem, a specific problem of leadership in the EU. If I compare with NATO, in the EU, there is no individual country able with his military strengths to guarantee and reassure the security of the whole union. Therefore, a different kind of leadership mechanism is absolutely necessary, likely through more integration. Third, the lack of integration entails a huge waste of uh, resources in defense investments. And I will not uh, uh, come back on all uh, the data that you can uh, get about the difference between uh, the Europe and the United States in this, uh, uh, in this uh, arena. Uh, we uh, now reach uh, more than 200 billion a year in the defense budget if we add all the national budget and that make us the third most powerful defense player after the United States and China. But this um, uh, is not meaningful. It's meaningless because uh, it is managed by 27 different decision makers. And uh, there is no indeed EU defense budget. <laughs> For uh, despite the agreement of 2016, I think it's my uh, view that an effective NATO EU complementarity in defense stays unclear. Instead of talking of unnecessary duplication, we should rather talk of necessary duplication. That is for the most uh, important remarks I have on the failing of CSDP. And now let me uh, elaborate a little bit on the ways uh, from my perspective to uh, improve uh, necessary effectiveness and uh, credibility. From a political perspective, considering that the EU building a project is the way to get more power and more influence for two weak European nation in the context of the 21st century. It implies that some responsibilities and tasks be transferred from nation to the EU level and manage in common at this level. Sharing sovereignty at the EU level to compensate loss of power at national level. That is the deal and we must uh, see now how to proceed. Some remarks about it in uh, five points. First, enlarge competence of the current CSDP in the defense field. Define common EU interests, threats, and defense objectives. This process is engaged already with a strategic uh, compass, but uh, we must uh, go further and likely toward a, a true uh, EU defense white book, considering the EU as uh, an achieved united entity. This will lead to stronger solidarity and make the national security interests of member states closer and more consistent, opening the way to more complementarity and cooperation between member states on a regional or transverse basis uh, that will uh, conduct us uh, to be uh, interested in any uh, problem happening at, along the border of the European Union. That is very different uh, with the current situation in which uh, every country uh, looks like uh, only uh, interested uh, on the national border. <laughs> Second, we must uh, uh, create and develop a European common operational culture. 
inspired by the EU strategic autonomy goal, namely in addressing together comprehensive response to the requirements expressed in the EU White Book. We must train gradually operational people, civil and military, to think from a European feeling and shared perspective of threat and response, overcoming and extending the national ones. We must create a, a European defense conscience. This requires solid information to our citizens who will have to agree and support this project. And in this area, we must uh, uh, note the difference with, uh, with NATO. Uh, a lot of things uh, in common in NATO has created a, a sort of common culture. But the common culture that we must uh, set up in the European Union must be a little different, different. Because in the European Union, we have not uh, uh, this superpower which ensure that everything at the end of the planning will be a success. Third remark, improve leadership at the EU level in making it more visible, more effective and more credible. This requires more anticipation of member states about their possible commitment in EU mission and operation. The European White Paper should highlight the main possible scenarios to be addressed by the EU to defend and protect eventually autonomously, on which potential member states' contribution could be anticipated. This should pave the way to improving the EU responsiveness thanks to a quicker political decision making supported by a full-fledged civil command structure, permanent and qualified. So, a sort of uh, consistency should uh, exist, starting from the top, the white book, uh, going down to the objective, common objective, then common capabilities, and then uh, the uh, nation uh, contribution, and also a, a full-fledged uh, common structure, starting from the top political level and down to the soldiers. That is my view on the leadership. Three, we must define where more integration is desirable in the organization structure and instruments of CSDP. The measures contained in the implementation plan on security and defense issued by uh, the high representative go in the right direction, but with a blurred definition of integration or at least insufficient uh, definition. Uh, as uh, Thierry Tardy of the IESS says in a document, in essence, uh, how to shall uh, the EU implement the uh, comp comprehensive approach? And the answer would be through the operational integration. We need to examine in more detail uh, all the uh, parts where more integration is necessary. Uh, Fifth, uh, we must uh, improve the operational cooperation between EU and NATO in the sense of more responsibility to be bared by the European and uh, alleviation of the US burden. We must uh, analyze uh, all uh, the aspects in which uh, the EU should do more. And uh, uh, in, from my perspective, I think that uh, the European can reinforce their contribution to NATO only in doing it together. In conclusion, to summarize, the key question is to know if the European wants to be able and ready to launch common operation, namely when or where the US will not play. If it is the case, they will have to agree on the way to harness it. Stay with intergovernmental cooperation and limited power at the EU level, or go for more integration and accept to share sovereignty. If they consider that more integration is an objective, they must accept to go from several national bodies to single operation, one EU, European one, excuse me, running from the benefit of all participation nations. All of us know that a European army is still an utopia as long as an European government has not been created. But an European army might be organized differently of national one. 
For example, we may imagine no mix of soldiers at low level. Anyway, the need to mutualize capabilities stay urgent and vital for our countries to protect their interests and keep influence in the 21st century world. This is only possible in considering the defense of our continent as a whole, in which national requirements take place as in a puzzle. Only such an approach may lead to transform the intersection of national security interest into an addition of member state strengths. This is the way toward an effective federation of nation states. They are on, on, on the other part, the uh, European Co Commission offers now an opportunity to stimulate this movement through the EDF already mentioned and uh, uh, could see his area of responsibility extended in the future, for example, in developing capabilities at the EU level. Thank you for attention. Thank you for your very interesting contribution, uh, Jean-Paul Perouche. Uh, now we uh, go on to our uh, friend from Germany, Heinz Schulte, please. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And giving the progress of time, I will be very short indeed. I first of all want to commend the uh, outreach working group on the title, Breaking the Impasse. And I would put a thesis to you that a major impasse uh, has been broken in a different field in Brussels last year, which will have an immediate impact on defense. You all recall that there is a Hamiltonian moment. The Hamiltonian moment was when the then um, the finance minister in Washington invited the states in America that he would take over the debt. And that was the beginning of the United States of America. And I put it to you that we had a Hamiltonian moment by stealth last year when the budget was agreed and the 750 million billion 750 billion euro investment program, partly to be paid by the European Union having its own debt raised. We will not be, I put it to you, be able to go back to the status quo ante on that issue. We have moved Europe in a different way and that will have implications for defense as well. I would want to make two bullet points. The one is about the change of government in Germany that you will see in September, in four months time, the Merkel era is over after 16 years. And the second is a German view on, and Federico, I thank you for that, what you already mentioned on the PESCO program, namely military mobility and what it really means. And the context of all that is, that the issue of this European strategic autonomy against the background of the Hamiltonian moment by stealth is the cloud. If Europe is sovereign, the issue where my data is as a citizen, uh, my medical data, my banking data, wherever, is it in an American cloud or is it in a, a, a Chinese cloud or is it in a European cloud? If we're building a European cloud that has consequences, for example, for combat systems, like the future combat air system, the Franco-German-Spanish program. Because be clear, if you fly the F-35 today, your data goes via America. And America knows exactly who is flying the plane and what the operational envelope is. So if you talk about European autonomy, it is not about the number of tanks. It is not about um, specialization in certain fields of defense. It is about the cloud, because the cloud is the idea of where my data as your European is protected. I think that is very important. Now to Germany, very quickly. We are going to have a new government in September. And if the opinion polls are not completely incorrect, we will have the participation of the Green Party in that. Either we'll get a Green Chancellor, a Lady Chancellor from the Green Party, Annalena Baerbock, or we've got to get a coalition between the Christian Democrats and the Greens. What will that mean for defense? First of all, the Greens have arrived in the middle of Europe, and I do not see that they will depart from a general pro-European line. I think the whole German policy towards Europe will not change 
in the fundamental issues. There will be issues about 2% of uh, gross national product uh, spent on defense. There will be an issue like replacing the tornado in the nuclear role in, in the NATO context. But the general disposition of Germany towards Europe and the need for European defense will not change. And that government, whether it will be led by the conservatives or by the Greens, could not go back to the status quo ante, which from a German point of view was very important. Maastricht criteria, 3% deficit and all the rest of it. That will not happen anymore. We have moved on. And that will have a profound implication on Europe. And finally, Chairman, let's look at this European mobility program. Military mobility is a PESCO program. It's a European program. And the fact that, uh, as already mentioned, the United States, Canada, and Norway, brackets, interestingly, the British have not asked to participate in that, mm -hmm. immediately joined. And it is not a program where the Americans automatically would take the lead, but participate in the European program is progress in itself. Sending 50,000 soldiers to the, to the Eastern flank is progress. So uh, to cut a long story short, what I would propose to you is that the, that the European cloud and the uh, issue of a European combat cloud where all our data were in, and that will be embraced by programs like the future combat aircraft. It could be land systems. Where do our intelligence go? All that will be in a cloud and that has to be European. That seems to me to be breaking the impasse and it will be about European strategic autonomy. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Schutte. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to start with a question of my own. Um, and then after that, we can go uh, to the questions of the, of the attendees, which I would all encourage you to ask in the chat. Um, now, I think many are at the moment cautious of uh, defense, of, of spending cuts in defense in the context of the COVID uh, pandemic. By some, this is also uh, marked as a, a chance for further European defense integration. Um, now, I was wondering, in your national context, your respective national context, what opportunities does this open up? Does this maybe pose dangers? Um, and do you see potential uh, conflicts between these opportunities and goals that are being set by your respective countries? Anyone who would like to uh, tackle that question, is, feel free to do so. Let me start. First of all, it's the definition, as you all know, is what constitutes defense. In the French context, I understand the fire brigade is part of the defense budget. In other countries like Great Britain, the intelligence services are part of the defense budget. So first of all, what constitutes defense? Is it hardcore or is it more? And if you now look at the strategic mobility issue, making roads better, and reinforcing bridges so that they can take tanks. Is that defense related or is it not? From that point of view, it seems to me, it goes beyond the classic definition of the defense budget and also the question, how much is allocated to research and development and procurement, the famous 30%. So it seems to me that we're gonna have a debate whether the whole issue of climate change and the investment we are gonna do in Europe, including a European cloud, is not already defense related. And it's against that background that I then want to focus and concentrate on what is the hardcore defense issues? How many tanks are you gonna buy? How many soldiers can you equip, etc.? Thank you. Uh, does anyone else would like, want to respond to this? Maybe to, <clears throat> to extend uh, uh, a, a little uh, uh, argument to this, uh, to this conversation. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, mention that uh, uh, in the past, uh, spending cuts have never uh, conducted to a more uh, defense integration in the past. But in the future, uh, we must think about how to improve uh, 
uh, the, the common action of the European. There are uh, two, two ways. The first one is top down. It, it starts from a political common views and objectives. What I sum up in, in the project of a European white book in order that all the defense uh, matters are appropriated by all the countries, all chief of governments. That's the top, bound, top down uh, effort away. And the second is bottom up. We have seen in the past that it is from a concrete needs that uh, Europe uh, progresses, progressed. Uh, and uh, I could just uh, underline in this uh, to illustrate that uh, what, what happened uh, with the pandemic uh, in uh, uh, the uh, role of the European Union. Uh, according to the treaty, there was no role at all for, for the European Union when dealing with, uh, with health care and so forth. And, uh, uh, but because uh, member states uh, quickly uh, saw that uh, operating individually would conduct to the chaos of concurrency, competition between the nation to get masks, to get uh, vaccine, etc. They decided to manage that at the European level. And it is, uh, and we, we could uh, extend that to, to the migration phenomenon. Huh? And uh, uh, so it's from, from these needs, from these threats, from this risk, or from this uh, inability of nation to deal with a problem that we can progress toward more uh, European integration. So if we imagine the two moves together, one coming from top down and the other from very concrete needs, huh, uh, we may uh, dream of more integration and more uh, uh, greater development of the EU defense. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your very insightful reply. Um, I was wondering, there was a question from the, from the audience. Um, the question is, who would be the chief of the EU armed forces <laughs> at the top of the EU defense organization? Would this belong to the member states or to the European Union? Maybe mm -hmm. Federico, do you want to answer? Because we, you didn't speak so far. <laughs> Your mic, your mic. <laughs> Federico, please click on the mic. <laughs> the question was for Eric because he is. Uh... Okay, you want me to, to you want me to answer? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm not really a coward, but I repeat to what we wrote in the recommendations makes it easier. Um, and the recommendations we have said, blue badges, personnel in, in uh, EU military units uh, have an EU passport, no, um, uh, no connections with their uh, national governments or whatever. And they're all uh, professional staff. And that counts for the top also. So that's a clear answer. In my I, opinion. Agree with, I agree with you, Eric. I think that the question is fairly static. Are we not in a process where we move on? In the United States, it doesn't matter whether the man who has the finger on the nuclear trigger in the submarine comes from Milwaukee or from New York. Exactly. If I see the next level of Europe, does it matter that the man who commands it comes from Britannia or from Holland or what have you? So it seems to me that the Hamiltonian process, namely that we are moving towards a European Union and not by the big idea, the big bang, but we woke up one morning and we saw that the pandemic has changed the world. And do we think that that is gonna go back? And that in the fight between China and America, currency plays a role and that the European currency is far too important to be discarded. All that leads to a new generation of thinking and it doesn't matter when the man who leads the European forces, whether they're assembled or whether they're together, is um, from any part of Europe as long as he has the European passport that Eric talked about. 
the, bl the blue uh, batches. We talk about the blue batches. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we must uh, stay uh, realistic and uh, uh, until we have not achieved a solid uh, political leadership at the EU level. It is unthinkable that uh, 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 supranational uh, chief could command an EU operation. Uh, uh, I, just I will finish on that. Uh, uh, so far, and I think that it will last for a while, uh, each time that you have an intergovernmental coalition, uh, it is a country which uh, contribute with the most important contingent most most comparison uh, most important force that uh, 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 design the the, the boss and uh, the uh, operational commander and it's a problem because uh, by years we have no sucker with all the us uh, assets uh, uh, beyond him or uh, behind him and uh, yeah. that's a problem. That's the main problem. And we, we can imagine that to progress to more integrated European uh, structure command, uh, we must imagine that, that we make progress in the political field as well. Uh, can I still comment on that, please? Yeah. Um, we, sometimes we make progress in unexpected ways. Uh, here in the Netherlands, uh, the Ministry of uh, Defence was not very progressive until recently. And then all of a sudden, um, the notion of specialization was accepted. And almost without realizing that specialization means integration. It's uh, as soon as the country says, well, we cannot do everything and we don't have the money and we don't have the people. And we, and we, we have, I think in, in, in Holland only we have uh, nine 9,000 vacancies in the military. Um, I know there are a lot of European countries that would love to fill these vacancies. Um, but specialization, say, for example, the Netherlands specializes in submarines and maritime affairs and somewhat and, and one air brigade. Uh, it means you're completely dependent on other countries to do anything. Um, and that is now an accepted fact in Holland. So it's a step that has consequences that not everybody realizes, but in the next five to 10 years, you will see that that automatically leads to the top to combine all these things together and to make it a complete whole. Um, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> okay, thank you all. Um, I think I'd like to go on to a question, another question from the audience uh, coming uh, from Ron Keller. He's, he's, he's asking, how can we move towards European defense capabilities without irritating the US? And since we have a wealth of uh, NATO specialists here, we might have a good answer to that. And maybe I, I could piggyback on that by asking the same about the uh, Eastern European uh, EU members who are more apprehensive about EU uh, defense cooperation in and more in favor of US uh, approach, based approach. If I um, may. Dennis. It's open now. Yes. Yes, it's a very good question. Uh, I think that there is an image that progressing in European Union defense is something that is going to be uh, deteriorating NATO. At least theoretically, it is not. There are, you recall, there was a declaration after the summit in 2016, and then another one in Brussels after, in, after 2000. Uh, of 18, in which NATO and European Union at the highest possible level, they were the Secretary General, administrative level, but the Secretary General, the uh, President of the Commission and the President of the European Council signed a declaration establishing many areas. I think, I, I am speaking by heart, but I think there are 74 areas of cooperation. Of course, that's the official way of doing things. And, of course, it has progressed very much the conversation between the two states. Before there was no, no conversation, no relationship, uh, personal 
the people working at the European Union uh, military staff and the people working in the, at NATO headquarters. But now that uh, conversation, that relationship that perhaps in the past happened from time to time, but now is well established and there are projects, there are projects in progress, in process. But of course, when it comes to the real thing, at the end, then we will have to make some important decisions and that will take some time. But so far, we are so much behind and that's something that is pushing us to do something because I think the title of the presentation today was very significant, I think, breaking the impasse. Okay, we have been speaking now since, uh, since after Maastricht uh, Treaty on the progress of the European defense, the, foreign, the common foreign security policy, the common, poli the common security and defense policy. We are speaking about many things. We do have now, I think, even too many initiatives trying to progress from industrial, for capabilities aspects, for many things. And now we have CAR for defense, introducing a way of going ahead in defense planning. So we have done a lot, but of course, uh, it's only words. We are speaking about the commander before, and of course there are too many kinds of commanders. There is an operational commander, that's one thing that we have now also, but we have a mission on operation in some plan in Mali or forever, there is a, an operational commander, but for example, uh, we have an European Union military staff with a president as a way, the same way that NATO have. NATO have the military committee that theoretically is the highest military body with the president. And then we do have the commands, uh, strategic commands. We have, especially the operational command, uh, that is general world, workers now. So there are many, many things. These issues are very, very important, very hard, have to be developed. But if we keep discussing amongst us and procrastinating in advancing in the real thing, we are not going to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hans, please. Yes, thank you. I think the elephant in the room is China from an American point of view, and there's a little elephant in the room that is Russia. So if Europe can help the United States in focusing on China by looking more at Europe, the benefit of the United States of an integrated European defense outweighs the disadvantages from an American point of view, yeah. trying to run yeah. all the shows at the same time. I come back to the cloud. From an American point of view, it would be all better if we fly the F-35 and the cloud is American. If there is European capability with the European cloud, the oh. Americans don't like it. But the price that America, in terms of division of labor, can look more at China, while we look at Europe, not doing away with the Americans, I think is the key. And the second question we have to ask ourselves, Federico, is do we believe that there is a conventional symmetric threat on the Eastern Front? Or is it an asymmetrical threat with symmetric elements in it? Because that will define our force posture tremendously. And that is the second question we have to ask ourselves next to the question of the European cloud. A very, very good idea. I think in the, on the 26th of February this year, there was a meeting of the Council, of the European Council, the highest level. And then, uh, they task the high representative vice president, Mr. Borrell, to forward, the, to advance on the preparation of the strategic compass. And if do we have a guidance for intelligence, in that place we will see what is really what we want. Of course, the United States is one ally in NATO, a, a friend, especially with the new administration, in the, in the geopolitical arena. But if we do have our own, we will follow our own. But are we going to be able to do so? Well, we will see. But it's, the problem really is that we are ready. When I say we, I say all, small and big, powerful and weak, to give up some of our own sovereignty, some, 
not all, but some, in order to be able to solve, to have a cohesion in our world together. Very difficult, very difficult. But we have very wise people governing us, and I hope they will find a way to coordinate, to combine both approaches. We don't want to have enemies, and of course, we don't have to have enemies in the Western world. They are friends. Canada, Norway, and US, that you mentioned also, that uh, they are going to work to, with us on the mobility, military mobility. They are friends, they are not the EU members, and we have to take them in consideration, and we have to be in good terms with them. But at the same time, if we are powerful, if we are really powerful, if we get to be really powerful, we will be comprehensive and understanding of the other people. If we are weak, we will be afraid of doing anything. Thank you. There is something that has to be, <clears throat> to be uh, uh, watched very um, cautiously. It is uh, the kind of information that our citizens uh, receive from the media or from their political uh, masters. Because uh, for a lot of years now, we have listened uh, the progress made in the EU uh, in favor of a solid CSDP. And if you look at the, the uh, conclusion, the council conclusion that will be approved uh, the 10th of May, it is included uh, in this uh, conclusion that uh, we are determined uh, to go for more autonomy and we will enhance our capabilities to act, etc. But what is the result? We, we just created uh, as forces the famous battle groups that we have never used and that will never be used under the current uh, situation. And now I just learned today that uh, our political master, defense ministers decided, at least 14 of them, decided to propose the creation of a, a rapid reaction force of 5,000 people, 5,000 troops, <clears throat> uh, uh, on the basis of uh, uh, aggregation of battle group, for example, uh, to uh, react uh, swiftly if something happened, uh, of course, outside the territory of the European Union. But believe me, uh, I have been director general of the EU military staff in the past, and therefore I'm used to this declaration, to these statements, which shows uh, very big issues, but at the end of the day, nobody is, uh, is really ready to act. And yeah. if he can uh, <clears throat> look at uh, uh, acting for others, uh, they are very interested. That is the way that our political masters are working. Therefore, I said, just earlier, that uh, uh, we must have this, this common approach of the main uh, goals in terms of defense for the all, all the European Union. And from the other side, we need uh, the things to, to come bottom up from, from requirements, uh, uh, from the show of incapabilities of our nations. Uh, and that is the way on which uh, I, I, will, I will add also the ambivalence of the United States who would like to see their uh, European partners more uh, powerful, uh, stronger, but they are reluctant yeah, uh, to lose uh, their political pressure on, on the uh, European nation in terms of uh, uh, selling equipments and other political um, uh, supports, etc. We saw that many times in Iraq in, in different circumstances. And therefore, uh, until the US have not agreed to support the reinforcement of the European uh, together, uh, uh, we will uh, have serious difficulties to, to go on, to go forward. <laughs> I, I do agree 100%. But of course, the question about the political masters well, that's the, 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 the money that we have to pay for being a democracy. We have, we have mm -hmm. to follow the, the, our political masters. And I think that they are understanding little by little what is going on. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I recall another initiative that was initiated by France. Because I recall the name now, in European Independent Initi Initiative. Initiative. Uh, uh, so, initiative. Uh, what is happening mm -hmm. with that? Mm -hmm. yes, now we have, 
we have gathered, uh, I think, two, 12 or 13 countries uh, in, in Europe, including those uh, who no, do not belong to, to the European Union as, as Norway. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the things are moving very slowly. <laughs> yeah, I recall very much a picture, a photo of some Finnish soldiers marching when Finnish Finland joined that initiative. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that dance uh, as well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I, I think this is a, an excellent con uh, conclusion of the problems that we will be facing uh, in, the, in the years to come. Um, thank you all for this debate. Uh, I found it very, very interesting. Um, I think it's best if we now go on to the uh, conclusion words by Ernst van Hoek, the president of Eurodefense Netherlands. Thank you very much, uh, Bart. Uh, it was quite an interesting uh, debate or webinar, uh, however you call it, uh, with many aspects that are difficult to focus on one or two points only. But let's, let me make just one sidestep. We talked about the United States, its military power, its organization. In the Netherlands, that Many, time, many years ago at the presentation, I remarked to the audience that the Netherlands really had two ministries of defense. The one in the classical sense, but older and more successful, our ministry of public works, responsible to keep the sea out of our low lens. In the United States, the responsibility for dikes and bridges belongs to the Department of Defense the Corps of Engineers. And that is typically one area, I think, in which we can teach the United States a lesson. After mm -hmm. Katrina in New Orleans, they were too proud to accept our advice on it. But mm -hmm. they copy it nevertheless. So just to show that things are relative. I think the discussion also showed a little bit that if we want to improve our capabilities, as European Union, we have to do a number of things. Yes, we have to, uh, that, uh, to do better in the things that, you, that we classically did do and still do in NATO. NATO, by the way, only decides on unanimity. There is no qualified majority voting in NATO, as you all know. And at the same time, I also think that if we want to progress, we have to step outside of the box and jump over our own shadows a little bit. Eric mentioned a number of things and jean bert Peruche also, I think, demonstrated a number of ways. Before everything else, we have to believe that this is the way forward. And I think we have to talk to politicians and we can do that as your defense network uh, to try to not <coughs> be shy and not stay back in the past and try to do everything ourselves as sovereign national states in this European Union, because there's no way in which we're going to win the future versus upcoming powers as China it has been said. Many articles have been written about and the whole value system there is different. So if we want to cope with them in the rest of the century, we have to look at the way that they are looking at the world, which is different from the Western way. What I've heard uh, today, this afternoon, I think gives me hope at least that a number of people are ready to do this. And so I would say, let's all count forward on this way. And to end up, let me show you a little thing that I've hanging here. It's a plaque given. I hope that you can read it all. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I, I think we've come a far away from that conclusion by Mr. Juncker. And I'd like to thank you all for participating. And I wish you all a very good evening. Good night. Thank to you. Thank you. Good evening. Have a good evening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good evening. And, and thank you for uh, Euro Defense Outreach because they have built this uh, 
webinar. Yes, thank you, Bart. 